What do you think of when you hear the word empire? Maybe if you're like me, you imagine the Roman Empire dominating much of the world. Or maybe you think of the Galactic Empire from Star Wars, oppressing the peoples and aliens of a galaxy far, far away. Either way, I'm going to venture to guess you've generally heard it used with a negative connotation. Empire building is achieved through imperialism, or the practice of stronger countries extending economic, political, and military control over weaker countries. In this video, we're going to examine the similarities and differences in attitudes about our nation's proper place in the world. And in doing so, we'll take a closer look at two examples of American imperial expansion, Alaska and Hawaii. In the late 1800s, imperialism was very much in style as European countries dominated much of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Not wanting to miss out, the United States began to look beyond its own shores as well. Now, while it may seem that the United States was a bit late to the imperialism game, it's worth noting that the U.S. was busy doing its own version of imperialism right here at home with the conquest of the West. However, by the 1890s, when historian Frederick Jackson Turner announced that the frontier was closed, expansion-minded American imperialists set their sights on territory beyond our shores. Several factors motivated expansion in the late 1800s. First was economic. The promise of overseas markets in which to sell American products and new resources to be obtained were sure to help grow the American economy and lie in the pockets of many wealthy American industrialists. Second was social. Social Darwinist theory divided the world into civilized and uncivilized nations. The Western powers, they reasoned, were the most civilized in the world. The Anglo-Saxon people of the world had the highest political talents, and by spreading their culture, their religion, and their influence to other parts of the world, they could uplift the uncivilized peoples of the globe. Third was military. And for this, let's take a look at the writings of Captain Alfred Mahan. In his book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, a real page turner, Mahan argued that a strong navy was necessary in order to be an imperial power. To that end, the United States should acquire territories throughout the Pacific in order to maintain naval dominance throughout the world. In fact, as early as 1867, early proponents of imperialism gained an important victory when Secretary of State William Seward purchased Alaska from Russia. The purchase that was dubbed Seward's Folly by critics proved to be a boon for the United States. The territory was far more than the snow-covered ice box that was overrun by polar bears that critics had claimed. It was, in fact, a massive resource-rich addition to the United States, filled with gold and oil and other resources just waiting to be exploited. Many Americans began to see the economic benefit of overseas expansion. Perhaps a better example of American imperialism in the late 19th century would be what happened to the sovereign island nation of Hawaii. As early as 1820, American missionaries began arriving in Hawaii, preaching Protestant Christianity and seeking to make a profit. In the decades that followed, more and more Americans arrived on the island and they began buying up land and cornering the lucrative sugar market. The sugar industry made many American planters wealthy and powerful as they began exercising more control over the government of Hawaii. In the years that passed, the native Hawaiian population dwindled and so did their control over their economy. In 1890, the American Congress passed the McKinley Tariff, which enacted barriers against Hawaiian sugar. The prospect of exporting sugar to the United States tariff-free led many American planters to push for annexation by the United States. They were met with resistance, however, in the form of Hawaiian Queen Lou Kalani. The Queen pushed for a new constitution, one that would protect the rights of native Hawaiians. Alarmed by this, the American planters formed a new organization ironically named the Committee of Safety. The committee, with the unauthorized support of American Marines, staged a coup and removed the Queen from power. They set up a new provisional government that further limited Native Hawaiian rights, and they named Sanford B. Dole as the new president of the new Republic of Hawaii. The government continued to push for annexation by the United States for the next several years until 1898, when the island nation officially became an American territory. Though imperialism was unquestionably popular in the United States, it should be noted that not all Americans were on board with the March of the Flag throughout the globe. 
In fact, the American Anti-Imperialist League was formed in the late 1890s to oppose American conquest of the Philippines following the Spanish-American War. The League consisted of individuals such as author Mark Twain, labor leaders like Samuel Gompers, and industrialists like Andrew Carnegie. They raised many objections to American imperial expansion, some of them social, some of them economic. They reasoned that building a colonial empire betrayed the nation's founding. After all, the United States started off as a colony. They reasoned that maintaining such an empire would be far too costly. And some argued that it would provide cheap foreign labor which might take away jobs for white Americans. However, whatever their objections, the United States continued to grow as a world power in the decades to come. So there you have it. In this video, we discuss the rise of American imperialism and the various attitudes regarding it. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe, and I'll be sure to make more to help you succeed in your American history class.